Hello all of my history loving friends. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're here today. If this is your first time, this is a history channel. I typically do stories on people who are no longer alive. If you like history, you will probably like my channel. Please subscribe, please like videos, so the algorithm will share them with other people. Today we are doing part two of the Jack the Ripper Victims series. Today we will be talking about Annie Chapman. Annie Chapman's life is just as sad as Polly Nichols, who was in our last episode. A note about the last episode, the photograph I shared with you that is all over the internet that says that it is a picture of Polly Nichols is not. There is only one victim that there is actually authenticated photo of the victim, and that is of Annie Chapman. And the reason is because she came from a higher social status than any of the other victims. Annie Chapman's father was a military man. He was a member of Queen Victoria's Second Lifeguards. He was only 16 years old when he was recruited. His older brother was also a member. Somewhere around this time, he met Annie's mother. Her name was Ruth Chapman, the lifeguards. Well, the ladies found them very attractive, and it was common to say that one might have caught the scarlet fever from these handsome young men. They weren't allowed to get married. Only about six out of every 100 soldiers was given permission to marry. So all of the women that they had relationships with, they weren't legitimate relationships, and it put the women in a precarious position. If she got into trouble, she still couldn't get married, and that ended up happening to Ruth. In September of 1841, Annie was born. George got permission to marry her. So after having two children, they did get married, and the army allowed them to backdate when they got married by two years so that the kids would seem legitimate. They would have moved into the barracks, which would have been so awkward. So you would have a barracks like you would envision with all, with all of these soldiers walking around half naked, cursing, telling dirty jokes, with women and children sleeping at the end of the barracks, with nothing for privacy but just some blankets and sheets hung up to block off where they're sleeping, and not to mention that the barracks were absolutely filthy. Eventually, families like theirs they did make arrangements in the late 1840s, so that means the first six or seven years of Annie Chapman's life, she was living in a soldier barracks. At some point, they were able to get an allowance for married couples and families to have their own place. It would have been a very kind of dilapidated, not very nice place to live, but at least it was private. As the child of a soldier, they moved very frequently. Between 1840 and 1860, the family lived at 12 different addresses. One advantage of being a child of a soldier is that they were given a good education through the military school. Girls, boys, didn't matter. Everyone was educated. It was kind of a strange world that Annie found herself in on the social ladder in that her father didn't make much money. However, they always had to look nice. They were also taught to sound very proper, to behave very proper. They also were very often in contact with sort of the mucky mucks. It was not uncommon to see the Queen and Prince Albert and other nobles. As time went on, living conditions got worse for military families. This is partly because rents went up so much. They were pushed into lower quality housing full of more people. In 1854, they were living in a two bedroom dwelling with another family. Each family had a room and then there would have been a communal space, so a living area and a lavatory that they were sharing. They were living in the Knightsbridge area of London, and everything was very crowded. So there were six children in Annie's family. I don't know how many children were living in the other family, but they were all crammed in together. And sadly, in May of 1854, a scarlet fever epidemic struck. It was taking out multiple children in families at a time. Two and a half year old Miriam fell down with scarlet fever. When the rash showed up, the family had no doubt what she had. This illness came with flu-like symptoms, raging fevers, and this rash. So she watched four of her five siblings die of this horrifying disease. Their family, of course, wasn't the only one who suffered this, the loss of multiple children in this epidemic. After the death of their four children, Ruth and George did carry on. They had three more children. By 1861, Annie had turned about 19 and she had entered domestic service, which is what most young women did at this time. They were live-in servants. She took a job in Westminster for a former architect named William Luer. 
He was 67 years old and he was living with his bachelor brother, Robert. And this is who she and two other women were being servants for. Her father was in his 40s at this point and he was to the point where he was going to have to start thinking about retiring. He had a exemplary record he was chosen to serve as a valet for one of his commanding officers. It was a very prestigious position. George Smith was chosen by Roger Henry William Palmer, who had participated in the charge of the light brigade. And he chose George to be his valet from all of the candidates. He would have been given a lot of privilege for having this position. Palmer would have told him his secrets. He would have shared intimate details about military affairs he would have been his confidant. In 1862, George began working for another officer named Captain Thomas Naylor Leland. Leland loved him so much as his valet that he asked him to leave the army. Leland was going to go to Paris to get married and he was changing regiments and he wanted to make George a part of his permanent household staff. He would have been up there in ranking with the butler, which is the highest position you can have as a domestic and he decided to accept the offer. And in 1863, he became Mr. Smith. He was no longer associated with the army. He was retired and he was a permanent member of the domestic staff for Captain Leland. It appears that leaving the army affected George very negatively. He seems to have had time to think about all that he had lost. He must have missed his companions in the army. He was away from his family a lot. And in June of 1863, he traveled with his employer to work at a horse race. He was sharing a room at a pub called Elephant and Castle with one of Leland's other valets, and he seemed fine. They slept that night. The next morning, they hollered to him to say, it's time to get up, we have things to do. And he said something like, that's fine, I'm awake. But he still didn't appear for another hour, and so the landlady went to go check on him, and he was there with his throat slashed, they didn't want to bother the races. Leland came, saw what had happened. He was apparently horrified by it. But in order for the races to not get canceled, they very quickly just ruled it a suicide and moved on. He paid for George's funeral expenses. I personally, I have a hard time believing he would have killed himself. Now, he was definitely, since he had left the army, he had been abusing alcohol. It did not appear to have been bothering his performance and his job. Obviously, Leland was extremely happy with his service and very upset by what happened to him. I just find it hard to believe he would do this to his wife and kids. Now, I know he had lost four. I can't imagine the horror of going through that. What he was doing had helped his family so much. They had their own home now. They lived really close to Leland's estate. They weren't living with a ton of people. I mean, he had had so much pay increase. And by dying like this, his wife got nothing. She didn't get anything of his pension. He was literally cutting his family off from all support if he chose to kill himself like this. And so yes, he was found with the razor lying next to him by his hand. But do you know how easy it is to kill someone like that and just lay the murder weapon right next to them? I don't know. I Obviously, there's. I, I'm just speculating at this point. It just seems odd to me. It's... and it's kind of... Given the way Annie died, it's also just kind of a little ironic, I guess. Ruth invested the money that Leland probably gave her. This is speculation, but more than likely, she got something from him, because if she hadn't, they would have been in the workhouse. She ended up moving the family back to a home they had lived in in 1851. The address was 29 Montpelier Street. It had a full kitchen. It also had extra rooms that she could use to rent out to lodgers. A man named John Chapman, who was a coach driver, at some point in the mid to late 60s came to her door looking for lodging. They weren't related, although their last names had been the same, but somehow she met John Chapman and they had some sort of very nice relationship going on. And they were married in All Saints Church in Knightsbridge. It is still there. It is a beautiful cathedral. The inside hasn't changed much since when they got married. As a head coachman, her husband would have been at the top of the domestic service hierarchy. In 1879, he took a position with Francis Tress Berry, who had made his fortune in mining. He bought a huge estate called St. Leonard's in Windsor, which overlooked Windsor Castle. He and Annie and their family would have had to have lived near the stables so that he could keep track of those employees, specifically the groomer, and how they were caring for the animals. He was basically their boss. 
he had a very important position. He would have always had to have looked nice. He was the public face of his employer. So anytime they traveled anywhere, he was driving them around. The position had some perks in that they could have their own home. They would have had a parlor. I believe it had four rooms. To Annie, who had lived in such cramped quarters, it must have seemed f just fabulous. From the outside, their, their life just seems wonderful. I don't know when Annie developed her addiction. Her father had it though. And this was also a society where alcohol is literally everywhere. The water's not safe to drink. So you would have beer instead of water. Her eldest daughter, Emily Ruth, was born healthy, but she got sickly as she got older. Her second daughter died one day after being born. Her third daughter, clearly we now recognize it as her having fetal alcohol syndrome. They were only just starting to figure this out around the time that Annie was having children, the late 1870s. But she has all of the physical characteristics if you look at the photographs of her. Her fourth and fifth child, they each lived a few weeks after being born. Her final living child was born paralyzed and very disabled. So she had to have known after losing all of these children, she lost of seven children, five died, and her eldest daughter in, died in 1882 of meningitis. Seems to be what really pushed Annie to the breaking point. When she lost Emily, she went off the deep end. She actually disappeared for a little while, and her family had to find her. She was frequently being found wandering the streets, just clearly in so much emotional pain and grief that her sisters finally realized they had to do something about it. They contacted Spellthorn Sanatorium. It was specifically a charitable organization for women who were addicted to alcohol. Annie was there a year, and the logbook says that she never had any trouble, and she returned home in 1883 to begin her life again. When she was released, she did seem to be doing better, and she seemed happier. She was able to stay away from the drink, and the story is that John came down with a cold and had a little nip of whiskey to help with that ailment. And that's another thing about this era is that all of the medications were alcohol. Her sisters claimed she got a whiff and that was it. And she left that evening, she went down to the pub and she got absolutely wasted, as we would say here in the US, modern US, and was started doing her old ways. It's believed at this point that John was given an ultimatum. If this continues, if you don't make Annie leave, you are going to be dismissed. It was such a risk to Mr. Barry's reputation. He could not have his employee's wife staggering around the estate drunk all of the time. So it was a mutual decision. There were no hard feelings, but Annie decided in her mind that she had failed. She was never going to beat this, so she was just going to give in to it. John was not cruel. He gave her a 10 shilling a week allowance to take care of her. Probably, he believed the plan would be she would go and live with her family. And this 10 shillings would help pay for the things she would need for them to take care of her. But her family were teetotalers. They had watched their father go through this. Now they were watching her. We know some of what we know about her addiction because her sister wrote things into the paper describing her situation and how alcohol had destroyed her family and her father and her sister. So she would have had to have gone without alcohol and probably was not willing to do that. So she ended up in Whitechapel. She did take up with another man and live with him for a while. It seems John wasn't really keeping track of where she was going and what she was doing or who she was with. He never cut her off. But the payment stopped abruptly, and she had no idea why. So she sought out her husband's relatives to find out what had happened, and it turned out that he was extremely ill. After she left, he was no longer working for Mr. Barry. He had sadly fallen into alcoholism himself. And at the age of 45, he was literally on his deathbed, and she decided she had to be there to go see him. I don't think this was all about money. She did want to know if what had happened to him was true, if the rumors of him being extremely ill. She walked for several days 
to get to Windsor, to see him, to be at his... I don't want to say deathbed because she wasn't actually there when he died, but to see him before he died. We don't know what was said between husband and wife. I'm sure goodbyes were said, that she knew she would never see him again. Once she got home and confided in a neighbor, she broke down and sobbed over what had happened to her husband, how sick he was, and the fact that he was gone. He died shortly after she left, leaving her completely destitute. The man that she had taken up with, he left as well. It Honestly, probably the loss of the money had something to do with that. She no longer had any money to support the two of them. John died in 1886, and people who knew Annie said that after he died and after the man she was living with left, she became despondent, and it was almost like she'd given up the will to live. But she was also extremely ill. She had tuberculosis, and after she died and they looked at her body, the disease was found to be extremely advanced, not only in her lungs, but also in her brain. On September 7th, Annie had been very sick. She had just gotten out of the hospital. She had some pills on her that were supposed to help with her lungs and whatever was making her feel so ill. She saw a friend, a Mrs. Palmer, who saw her and said that she was extremely pale. She told her that she didn't feel good at all. Actually, she said something to the effect of, I'm so ill, I don't feel like doing anything. And this friend saw her, she, the friend left, did something, came back, Annie was still in the same spot, she hadn't moved. So she was extremely sick. She was seen around midnight. She had a beer with a friend. She went out, got a little bit to eat. She had a, a baked potato that she brought back and had. She left. She ended up somehow at 29 Hanbury Street. 29 Hanbury Street was a well-known area known for being a good place to sleep if you had to sleep outside. And it's possible that Annie went here just to find a quiet place to sleep outdoors because she didn't have the money to get a bed that night. It had a hallway inside that went to a staircase. She was found in the garden area outside, laying along a fence with her head near the steps. The one thing about Annie being one of the victims is that she was so ill, they discovered once they were doing the postmortem on her body that she only had weeks to live just by the natural course of things. She was very advanced in her tuberculosis. Even just looking at the photo of her body, she is extremely swollen. She looks sick. I know she's obviously not alive in the photographs, but you can tell she was not a healthy human being those last few weeks of her life. Probably hadn't been healthy the last several years of her life, to be honest. Her story is extremely sad. Her funeral was September 14th, 1888. She was buried very quietly. Her family didn't want the funeral to be announced or publicized. Her family were the only ones in attendance. To this day, no one knows where her grave is located. They know which graveyard she's in, but they don't know where her grave is. So now there is a stone in there that says somewhere in this vicinity or within this area uh, that she's buried there. And a fall from grace, for sure. Uh, the power of addiction. She had a very sad life. She lost so many people that she loved. Very, very unfortunate story. I hope you guys have enjoyed this as much as you can with how sad the, the material was. But I think it's important to understand that these women were real, that we always talk about Jack, 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 who was he, who was he, who was he? Well, we don't know, and we probably never will, but the women he killed were real. Their deaths broke hearts of their families. They were moms and sisters and wives. They just had really sad lives and really bad luck and were already so vulnerable and yet still to have the end, their lives end this way is just so sad. I will see you next time. Of course, our next episode will be about Elizabeth Stride, who was the Ripper's third victim. I will see you next time.